all right. Brother Greg, would you t thank you? I'd appreciate that. <laughs> I asked him to turn the lights on, and he went and just kept on walking. <laughs> good evening, everybody. It's good to have you for night two of revival. Would you stand this evening? And let's go ahead and go into a time of praise as we open up the uh, service today. Oh, are you washed in the blood? Oh, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb. Oh, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Oh, are you blood, oh, in the soul, cleansing blood of the Lamb, oh, are your garments spotless, are they white as snow, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb, oh, yes, are you washed in the blood, oh, in the soul, cleansing blood. garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the land oh there is power power oh wonder working power in the blood of the land there is power power oh wonder working power in the precious Come on, sing it out, church. There is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, oh, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Come on, just one more time. There is power, power, oh, wonder-working power Lord of praise tonight. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this evening? Amen. Amen. It's so good to see each one of you. Welcome, as I said, to night two of revival, and we're expecting God to do some amazing things. Amen. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and uh, just get right into the service. And so just remain standing if you would. We'll go into prayer and then praise and worship. I want to thank all of our guests that are here that are not part of Oak Grove. Thank you so much for being here. You are welcome in this place. And I hope that you um, are blessed. And I hope that the Lord just touches your heart and your mind and your, your body and, and just refreshes you and restores you in this service today. Amen. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we open up today. Almighty Father, we thank you for revival. We thank you, God, for this time that we have to be able to come together to lift up the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, to worship you and to seek your holy face. God, we have prayed. We have prayed and we have sought you, God. We have asked, Lord, that you will move mightily in this service and in this uh, series of meetings. And, Lord, you, we have already felt your presence, God. Lord, you were alive and well in this place yesterday. But, Lord, we need more. We need more, God. Lord, we need a fire that's going to burn inside of us. We need something, God, to come and hit us today, Lord, that's going to stay with us, that's going to get us through those times when these meetings are over, Lord, that are going to get us through those times, those difficulties, God, and are going to uh, make it to where we're strong and make it to where we're bold and we're able to stand up in the face of the enemy and we're able to uh, remain victorious. God, I pray for this service tonight. Lord, I pray that your anointing would be upon it. I rebuke any spirit that may be trying to, to hinder. I, there will be no distractions. There will be no interruptions. There will be nothing, Lord, that will take away from God what you are wanting to do in this house today in the name of Jesus. God, we give you free reign in this house. And we pray that you will move mightily among us. And we give you all glory and honor in the name of Jesus, we pray. Let the church say amen. 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 Give him a praise one more time, if you would. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I will 
daughter brave and true and ever firmly take a stand. And as I onward go and daily meet the foe, blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Oh, blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Come on and give him praise in this house. Hallelujah. Come on, give him a real praise in this place today. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. You may be seated for a few moments. Praise God. Not going to make it in this life without him holding on to our hand, right? Amen. Amen. Once again, so glad to see each and every one of you. And we uh, are just so blessed to have our speaker here with us uh, this weekend. Sister Samantha McCutcheon did a fantastic job yesterday and uh, just believe that the Lord, in fact, she was telling us before service that she was going to go one direction and the Lord led her in another and I understand that completely. And you always want to go in whatever direction the Lord is leading you. Amen. And so uh, she's going to be coming up after our praise and worship is uh, finished today, but uh, we just are so glad to have her with us. And, uh, and her bow, I guess, <laughs> bow, uh, his name is Matt, and he's a bow, so anyway, but we're just glad to have them with us this week, will you make her welcome, uh, and let her know she's welcome in this house today, <laughs> amen, and next time we're going to get Matt to come up and do some music stuff, because he's super talented in music, and plays guitar, and harmonica, and the kazoo, and uh, I think a, I think a xylophone or something, I don't know, but anyway, but we'll get him to do something next time. I'm going to ask our ushers to come at this time, if they would, we're going to receive this evening's uh, offering. This offering goes to our speaker, 
And, you know, the Bible talks about that a workman is worthy of their hire. The, the Bible talks about that those uh, you, that you're not to uh, muzzle the ox that treads out the corn and not calling Sister Samantha an ox. But, uh, you know, she's, anyway, I'm going to let that go. Uh, but not calling her an ox. But, uh, but what we are saying is that when the man or woman of God gets behind the pulpit and they bring us the word that comes from the Holy Spirit, that we need to make sure that we're doing our part to bless them. Amen. They have blessed us. And we're going to do our part to bless them. So thank you for, uh, in advance for your giving. And I know that it's going to be a great blessing to her. And it's going to be a great blessing to you as well. Because any time that you give, uh, what does the word say about giving a, a prophet a, a cold drink of water, that you reap a prophet's reward. And I know that the Lord is going to bless you as you give today. Amen. Can we pray over the offering today? Father, we thank you for this time that we have. Lord, we thank you for the spirit that we already sense in this place. God, we know that your word says where two or three are gathered in your name. Well, Father, we have gathered here today, not in our name, not in the name of Oak Grove, but we have gathered here today under the same banner, the same name of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, our Messiah, our soon coming King, our Savior and our Lord. And so, Father, I just ask that your presence will remain in this place and that it will grow and that we will be swept away by the precious Holy Ghost today. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this offering many times over. Bless those that are able to give, those that are not, Lord. I pray that you will touch them as well. And God, I pray that this will meet uh, needs and that this will bless uh, our speaker. And God, that souls will be one to the kingdom of God because of seed that is being sown today. We glorify you and thank you for all that you are and all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you as you give today and as you're giving. Uh, my lovely wife is going to come, and originally she and I were going to sing a song together, and the Lord has been dealing with me about several things today, and he told me to sit down and shut up and to let her do a song, but this song in particular, how many of you have come tonight needing a miracle? How many of you have come tonight needing God to do something? You're saying, God, there's something I've been praying about. God, there's something that I need in my life or in the life of a loved one. Well, let me tell you that there is a miracle Hallelujah. There is a miracle that is in the making for you today. Glory to God. All right. Let's have a word of prayer real quickly. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your healing power. We ask that you will touch Sister Loris. In the name of Jesus, Father, we've been lifting her up in prayer, and we're believing, God, that you are going to touch her and you're going to strengthen her. And, Lord, we just thank you in advance for the healing that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. She knew she had to reach him. It was her last hope of ever being healed. And so she pressed through until she touched.
the Lord of praise in this house. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you stand to your feet all around this house? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for the miracle. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you because we know that you are still in the miracle working business. Lord, your strength has not waned. You are just as powerful today as you were when you spoke the world into existence, God. Lord, we just thank you because you know that you have made us a dependent people upon you. And God, we depend on you for the miracles that we need. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Can we just continue to worship him today? Hallelujah. These altars are always open. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Father. Well, I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. And man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. You came along and put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Let's sing that again. I said, I've searched the world. never enough, but then you came along and put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied here in your love. the God in the valley and there's not a place that your mercy and grace won't find me again You're the 
Just lift your hands and worship it all over the place today. Hallelujah. Clothed in rainbows of living colors, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder. Blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord 
God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. 
he who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. Just give God a mighty hand clap of praise in this house. So good to us. He is so good to us. Well, I just want to thank you guys for letting me be here with you again tonight. I am so honored to be here. You can be seated if you will. I want to do something. Um, your pastor has been saying that this is my bow on the front row. And he is pretty amazing, I think. He has, he does a lot of ministry at his church. God is using him unbelievably. And if he would right now, I would like for him to come up and testify just tonight. Just address the people for a minute. Good evening, everybody. How y'all doing? Um, is anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Yes. I wanted to, um, when Samantha first asked me about testifying tonight, I was just thinking, I mean, what have all the the wonderful miracles and things that he's done around me in my life. and um, But then I started thinking even a little bit more simply than that. Uh, really just thankful for the family and the, and the relationship with God that I've been able to experience in my life. Amen. Amen. Has anybody been in that place where you just had to rely on your relationship with the Lord? Right. You know, um, as Pastor Chris and Ms. Crystal have let Samantha and me tag along, uh, with her this uh, for this last night and tonight, even coming into this beautiful church, not just facility, but the beautiful church of people, you could definitely tell there's a family relationship here, and, and I'm thankful to be here. I'm encouraged when we come into this place, and I don't know how long you guys have been pastoring here or not, but the culture is already changing to a sense of where you can come into this place and say, I can sense the presence of God here. I can depend on people in this place to say, I can, I can call them if I need somebody to pray with me. I can call them if I need help with something. You, give yourselves a hand clap of praise for depending on God for saying, yes, thank you for this. Thank you, Lord, for the things that you've blessed me with. Amen? Amen. I'm ex expecting a great night tonight, even, even more miracles and signs than what we saw last night. Amen? Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? He is. I'm so thankful for the ministry that he's put on Matt's life and for the things that he speaks to him. I'm excited to see where God is taking us and, and those different and the things that he has planned for us. So if we if you will turn to Acts nineteen and verse one. Acts chapter nineteen and verse number one. And I know we get excited. I don't know about you, but I get excited when we get in the book of Acts. Because I believe that's one of the books that has not ended. I believe we're still writing the book of Acts. This is the act of the apostles. The acts of the Holy Spirit really could be what it's called. And I love to read in the book of Acts. So if you're in 19 and verse 1, it says, While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Ghost when you believe, he asked them. No, they replied, we have not even heard there is a Holy Ghost. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. They, there were about 12 men in all. Tonight I want to talk to you about that question that Paul asked. He said, have you received since you believed? Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? I believe we're living in a world right now where we have a whole lot of people answering just like those disciples did. They said, we have not even heard there be a Holy Ghost. We haven't even heard there is a Holy Spirit. We haven't heard about it at all. And we're having this happen because we've quit asking the question, have you received since you believed? Will you pray with me? Jesus, right now we come into your presence. 
Holy Spirit, we ask that you begin to fill this place, begin to flood this place, and begin to speak to hearts. There may be some in here who don't even believe in you. There may be some in here who are skeptical and nervous about you, but God, you are here to meet them right where they are. They don't have to be afraid. You love them, and you're calling them to more. There is so much more. We don't just have to stop at a little bit. We can have all of you. And God, today I pray that you begin to pour out yourself on us. We are calling on you. We're not satisfied, but we want more. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I was raised a Pentecostal. I have grown up in Pentecost my whole life, fourth generation, as far back as I can find. I've been raised in this. And if anybody's been in the Pentecostal church, you know that Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one place and in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and filled all the place where they were sitting. And cloven tongues of fire appeared upon each of them. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But it didn't stop there. They didn't just sit there and say, Woo, this is great. No, they began to go out into the street and they begin to preach and they begin to tell the people what had happened and Peter stood up that day and he said this is that that the prophet Joel prophesied about this is that that your young men will dream dreams and your old men will see visions that his spirit will be poured out on all flesh and your sons and daughters will prophesy this is that oh man it's exciting to think about it but what is amazing is that's the same fire that we still have today. It didn't stop in Acts. It didn't stop on the day of Pentecost, but it's still going. It's a person, and it's the Holy Spirit. There's no gimmicks. There's just guarantees. God has given the Holy Spirit to us. But I have found that we've been living in a culture where things are a little bit different. Hey, anybody here got kids, grandkids? Yes. Well, have you ever seen, right now, there's a phase going on where the kids are going on YouTube and they're watching YouTube videos of other children playing with toys. They'll watch other children play with doll babies. They'll watch other children play video games. They love it. And you sit there and you watch them and you think, well, goodness, don't you want to play with the doll baby? Don't, don't you want to play the game? Why do you just want to watch them do it? And we kind of pick at them a little bit. I've seen some things on Facebook picking at them. But in all honesty, we've been doing that in the church for years. We sit here and we'll read about what they did in Acts. And we'll read about the miracle signs and wonders that followed them. And we'll shout when the preacher gets up and talk about the chains being broken and all of those things. But we're just satisfied to sit on a pew and watch church happen. We don't engage in the worship. We don't engage in the preaching. We don't engage in the altar. We just sit back and say, well, that was a good service. That blessed me and I'm done. That's not okay. We've got to get up and begin to say, I want more. We've traded the comforter for convenience. We've been given the promise of power, and we've let it pass us by. Anybody got Amazon Prime? Don't be ashamed. I love it. I'm the biggest advocate of it. It used to be where if you would get on Amazon Prime, you get free shipping, and it would, your thing would come in, whatever you ordered would come in in two days. I mean, amazing. I know after COVID, it's quit with that whole two-day thing, and I miss it. But I loved Amazon Prime. And if I ever ordered something, and it will tell you. It will track your package. I am the biggest package tracker. I'm watching every day. I want to know when it's coming in. It will say, it will be here Monday by 9 p.m. I'm ready. It's Monday. I got an alarm on my phone. It's coming in today. And I get out there, and if it is 10 o'clock at night on a Monday, and that package is not on my doorstep, I am on there emailing the seller, where is this package? It said it would be here by 9, and it is 10. I need to know what's going on. And I have found that I'll do that with Amazon, and we'll all do that with Amazon. But when it comes to the promise of the Father that we set, that said it is here, it is available, it has arrived on your doorstep, and we haven't received it, we aren't saying, God, where is it? I want more. I've got to have it, and I want it all. 
And not just that, if I receive that package and it doesn't look like what it did online, I'm going to be checking on that too. And some of us in here say, well, I've received it. I've received this, but it doesn't look like what they had in Acts. You aren't doing anything like they're doing in Acts. You need to get Jesus on the main line and say, I want it all. I want every bit of what you have for me. I'm not satisfied with just where I am. Does it ever concern you that the Bible says miracle signs and wonders will accompany them that believe? It also says that we will cast out devils in his name. We will speak with new tongues. We will pick up deadly serpents and it will not hurt us. We will drink of a deadly poison. It will not hurt us. We read all those things and it doesn't say it will follow or accompany them that are apostles. doesn't say that it will accompany them who are perfect attendants of church for the past 50 years. No, it says them that believe should be seeing miracles, signs, and wonders. That's what the Bible tells us. Are we concerned with that? Are miracles, signs, and wonders accompanying you and accompanying me? I think a lot of times I read in James where it says that sometimes we read the Bible. It's basically the gist of what he's saying is we'll read the Bible and then we walk away from it and forget what it said. It's like walking by a mirror, seeing what you look like, and then walking away and forgetting what you look like. We have people who've been telling us for years what we can have. The growth in your life, the spiritual growth that you need in your life. And we see that and we say, yeah, I could have that. And then we just walk right by it. And we don't push for it. We don't seek for it. We don't want more of God. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody ever offers me a raise... And they say that this is what you got to do to get that raise. I'll start doing it. I'll start working extra hours. I'll start showing up to that job earlier in the morning. I'll start doing all kinds of stuff to get that raise because it has a priority in my life. You got kids. They say your kids can get a scholarship if they play baseball. You will be at every baseball game. You will sit out there in the heat of August and fight the gnat so that that child can get that scholarship. Why? Because it's a priority to you. But God says that you can have the power to raise the dead living on the inside of you, and we treat him like the guy in the middle of the mall that's been trying to sell us lotion for the 15th time. We walk by and we'll let him put a little sample on us, and we'll enjoy that smell, and we'll feel good about it, but then we'll walk right by it, never committing to it, never buying into it, never saying, yes, I want the whole thing. Don't just give me a little dab, give me the whole thing. We're not doing that with him. We're not doing that with the Lord, and I don't know, I'm going to be a little honest, and I think that's important. We need to, we need to share honestly in church about how we feel. And a little while ago, I got real discouraged with church, the whole institution of it. I just thought, what in the world are we doing here? There's got to be so much more than this. We come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, whenever. We come in, we get up, we sing songs, we preach, we do a little altar, we leave, and that's all it is. So that's all church is. I said, I don't even know if we actually believe God is going to do what he says he's going to do. So because I was in one of these services and a lady came up to be prayed for and we all gathered around and prayed for her and then we walked away and, and I looked at whoever was with me and I said, did you believe God was going to heal her? And they said, well, I, I believe he can. And I said, yeah, I don't think I believed it. I said, I don't think anybody down there believed God was going to heal her. I said, because I didn't ask her to test it out and see what the Lord had done. And she didn't walk away disappointed. I said, so I don't think anybody in that altar really believed anything was going to happen. And anyways, if you look at the church in Acts, you'll see that people walked around, and it said they walked around singing hymns to one another, just rejoicing in the Lord. Just exactly. We can't even get together for one hour a week and sing songs for 30 minutes without arguing and complaining and fussing and getting in fights. I thought, this can't be what Jesus was talking about. There's got to be more. And during this time, while I was seeing all this, I began to get sick in my body. Nothing real serious, but you know, if it's you, it's serious. 
And so as I was going through some things, I went to the doctor. They said, I think you need this medicine. This will help you. This is what will do it. So when I got home, I prayed. I said, God, just let this be the medicine that will work. And when I said that, I felt like God spoke to me and said, you don't need this medicine. And I said, well, then help them figure out what I do need. Just tell me what, you know, let it go right. And he said, you don't need this medicine. You need the Holy Spirit. When he spoke that, I thought, well, God, I have the Holy Spirit. I mean, I, you should remember you were there when I got baptized. And, and I just was real shocked about that. And when, he, when I said that, God spoke something to me that has changed my whole life. And he said, when you receive the initial evidence... He said, one time in that altar, he said, do you think you exhausted the vast, endless riches of who I am? He said, do you think that was all there is? He said, you got him and let's go. That's enough for me. No, he said, there is so much more. You know, you remember the services? I'll be honest, I don't remember these services, but I have been told about them so much that I feel like I lived them. You remember the services when people would come down to the altar to receive the Holy Spirit? They would seek every Sunday. You could preach on tithing. Those people would be down there seeking the Holy Ghost. I mean, they didn't care. They just wanted it. And they would sit there, and they'd pray over them, and they'd anoint them, and they'd say, turn them loose, and, and let go, and hold on, and send the fire, and send the rain. They'd send all the stuff, and then one glorious day, they finally received the Holy Ghost. They received the Holy Spirit, and they were so excited. And the next Sunday, you know what happened? They were sitting in their pew. They quit seeking. Why have we quit seeking? Do we think that's it? Do you think the initial, initial means first. The initial evidence when he says, all right, I'm with you. You say, well, thanks, and you're done. That's it. I had a, a guy online one time. He was, my, he was my friend, but he wanted to be more than friends, and I didn't know that. And he was texting me, and my friends told me, now don't text him because you don't, you don't like him like that, you know, and, and you don't want to lead him on. And I said, okay, I won't text him back. But every day, he said, how are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? How are you doing? Multiple times a day, how am I doing? I just wasn't answering back. I thought I'm trying to do what's right. But one day, I just couldn't take it. So I finally said, I'm good. Thank you for asking. And he said, that is so good. And he didn't text back anymore. He was done. And you know, that sounds so funny. You think, what in the world? It's as if the pursuit was just for the response. All he wanted was for me just to answer. It wasn't for the relationship, and that's exactly what we look like when we come and we seek the Holy Ghost, and we seek Him, and we seek Him. And He says, all right, I'm here. And you say, okay, okay, that's good. And then you don't pursue the relationship with Him anymore. That's all there is. Do you realize that when Jesus left, He said, it is good that I go away so that I can send you another comforter? Jesus is not on this earth anymore. The only God that is on this earth, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is the Holy Spirit. He is the one on the earth. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for us. God is in heaven, but the Holy Spirit is on the earth, and we are intended to have a relationship with Him. And a lot of people say, well, I don't believe in the Holy Spirit and all that fanatical stuff. I don't think you have to be crazy. I don't think you have to, he doesn't have to show up every service. I don't think you have to see all that, you know, miracle signs and wonders. I just don't think that happens like that anymore. Well, I heard a story about these people who were over in a, a village, I believe it was, in Africa, if I'm not mistaken. It was somewhere, a foreign country. And a pastor went over there to preach to them. And he saw an old abandoned train station there. And he asked him, he said, what happened to that train station? He said, well, they looked at him and they said, well, of course, trains don't run anymore. This is, this is just the remnants of what it was. But trains don't run anywhere anymore. They're, they're extinct. And he said, no, no, they still run. He said, I, trains still run. He was like, they just, that one doesn't run, but they do still run. 
and they fought him. They said, no, they don't. Trains don't exist. They don't use trains anymore. And the man looked at him, and he said, I took a train half the way here. Trains still run. And I'll tell you, you can say all day, well, I've walked around. I've lived in this area. I've lived here. I've been to every church, and I just don't see the Holy Ghost move like he did way back when. I just don't hear about it like it is in Acts. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit does that anymore. Well, I'm going to tell you, trains may not run where you live, but trains still run. Trains are still going. The Holy Spirit is still moving. Because I thought like you too. I thought, I haven't seen it, God. Why haven't we seen it? So you know what I did? I got on that beautiful thing called YouTube. And I started looking up people like Catherine Kuhlman and Oral Robert and A.A. Allen. And I started watching as people would get healed left and right. I watched a man stand up in front of a congregation. And he said, right now I believe God's wanting to heal somebody. He's saying, he said, if you've got cancer of your pancreas, if, you have, if you're deaf, if you have blindness, he said, God's wanting to heal you right now. He said, raise your hand and we're going to pray. And he prayed for those people. And all of a sudden, you heard shouts of people getting healed all through that audience. And he said, wait a minute, raise your hand if you didn't get healed. And I thought, oh, my goodness, I've never seen anything like this. And he said, people raise their hand. And he goes, all right, Jesus prayed twice, so can we. He said, let's pray for them. All of a sudden, everybody started shouting in there. People were getting healed. I thought, man, that's a train running right there. I'm excited. Get me on that train. God, if you can do it in their service, you can do it in my life. I want you to use me too. I want to be used by the Lord. I don't want to just sit here and say, well, because I haven't seen it, it's not real. It doesn't happen anymore. We can't be like that. Start surrounding yourself with people who do see it, who say, oh, yes, they can. Let me tell you about it. Let me tell you about how good he is. Stop asking people. I'm not going to ask somebody who can't sing to judge my voice of how I'm singing if I should stand up and sing. I'm not going to do that. You're not going to ask me to fix your car because the only two things I know about a car is how to put the key in the ignition and now I've got a car that doesn't even do that and how you got to put the gas in the, the gas tank. See, I'm not even good with that. <laughs> so you come and ask me, you say, can you help me fix my car? No, I cannot. I can offer you some horrible opinions about it, but that's it. And that's exactly what we do. We start asking people who haven't known the Holy Ghost one day in their life. And we say, well, do you think you can do it? No, I don't think you can do it. Well, then it must not be. No, find some people. There are some people who know. They had not been talking about him, and they ought to be talking about him, but they know. Find the ones who have lived it and who have walked in it and who know the Holy Spirit and how good he is. I want us to look at what Jesus said. I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but when he said, because, you know, you say, well, okay, I hear all those opinions. Whose opinion should I listen to? Jesus. That's whose opinion you should listen to. If you got any doubts, any questions, what did he say? He said, do not leave Jerusalem. He looked at his disciples. He said, don't leave Jerusalem until you have received the Holy Spirit. Don't do one thing. Don't go out there and teach a Sunday school class. Don't go out there and pray for anybody. He said, don't do one thing until you've received the Holy Spirit. I think that's pretty amazing. Because I used to say things like, well, you know, we believe in the Holy Spirit. It's just a denominational thing. It's just something we as Pentecostals believe in. No, it's not a denominational thing. It's just a Bible thing. He said, don't do one thing without him. Don't walk one step without the Holy Spirit. You're going to need him. That's why I sent him. I didn't just send him to be cute. I wanted you to have him because he will give you the power to live this Christian life. You think you're struggling. You think you feel beat up like you can't do it. He will give you the power to do this Christian life. There was a guy who came over here from China. And he said, it's amazing. He said, if you take the Holy Spirit out of the church in Acts... 95% of what they did would cease. He said, but if you take the Holy Spirit out of the church in America, 95% of what we do would still exist. Isn't that scary? It's scary of how far we have gotten from the things of the Lord and what he's called us to do. But I want to tell you this. You may be saying, a lot of times in church we ask this, we say, well, who is Jesus? Everybody can answer that. We're like, well, he's, he's the son of God. We're bought by his blood. He saved us. 
Who is God? He's the Father. He's the one who created heavens and earth, and he's the one at the, on the throne. That's who God is. And then you say, who's the Holy Spirit? And they say, well, he's the one that makes you shout and holler and hoop in the altar, and that's who he is. And he's so much more than that. That's not all he is. Who is he? What grieves him? What makes him happy? What hurts his heart? Who is the Holy Spirit? Do we know? Do we actually have that relationship? And you may be in here and you might say, well, yep, I have him. I've been filled with the Spirit. I speak with other tongues. I've got him. Yeah, you may have him, but if you don't keep a fire kindled, it will go out. It's not once Spirit-filled, always Spirit-filled. You know how we say it's not once saved, always saved? It's not once Spirit-filled, always Spirit-filled either. And a lot of people, I've had this question because... Like I said, I've been Pentecostal my whole life, and so I've been around good holiness people, and I've recognized that some people are just holiness, but they're hateful too. They're just mean. And you think, well, why in the world, if that's what holiness looks like, I don't think I want to be that because that's real sour. And I asked the Lord, I said, what, what makes people do that? What makes them get to that place where they, they've got the Holy Ghost, but they're just horrible people? And I feel like this is what he showed me. You know, when you get full of the Spirit, it's like filling up a cup. And they think that they've got to stay full. And that they're supposed to keep that thing filled to the brim and not spill it. So if anybody or anything in life brushes up against them and causes them to spill it, they get angry. And they just get frustrated because everything's hitting it, trying to spill their cup. And if you leave water in a cup for too long, I don't know if you've ever done that, but it gets nasty stuff start floating in it, and it gets stagnant, and it gets gross. It's because we're not supposed to stay filled up. You're supposed to be like a river of living water pouring out of you constantly. Why? Because the same spigot you got it from is still running. And you ought to be going to that spigot every day. So take that, what you've been given, and fling that stuff everywhere. Get it all over everybody, and then go get filled, and refilled, and refilled, and refilled till you're full again. That's what we're supposed to do. Every morning, going in and saying, God, fill me again. I'm empty, but I know you're still pouring out. I'm ready for some more. We need to do that because I see people all the time coming into churches for 25 years dealing with the same problem. Makes me think about if you have the, the power hooked up to your house and it's connected and everything, but you come into to church and you say, Well, I need you to pray for my eyes because I've been reading in the dark and, and it's been so cold, my toes have got some hypothermia on them, and, and I've just been eating bologna sandwiches because the, I don't use the stove. And you know what I'm going to tell you? I'm going to say, You're hooked up to the power. Turn it on. Stop living like that. You don't have to live like that. You're choosing to live like that because you're hooked up to the power. And that's the same thing I want to say to people who have been dealing with the same struggles, the same spiritual battles for 25, 50 years. You're hooked up to the power. Turn it on. Begin to operate in the power that he's given you. Stop living below what you have. Turn the power on in your life. I want to share this, though. You can't live a spirit-led life if you don't let the spirit lead. And you say, well, that sounds real simple. I figure, you know, spirit-led life, you've got to let the spirit lead. Yeah, it's a whole lot harder than it sounds because you've got to give up control. And giving up control is not easy. And you may say, well, I don't want to give him control. I don't, I just, I feel like I can control things. Okay, well, if he's not controlling your life, something is. You ever seen somebody who has anger problems and they get angry and they punch a hole through the wall? Well, they did not. They did not do that on their own accord. Nobody who's in their right mind would say, I've got a problem and so I'm going to create another problem by making a hole in the wall. Because now you got a problem in a hole in the wall, and that doesn't make any sense. What happened? Anger was controlling them. Anger was leading their life. Sometimes we let bitterness lead our lives. If you think about it, you ever been in Walmart? And you're walking around, and there's um, 
you hide behind the cereal because you see somebody over there that you don't like, you can't stand, and so you're hiding behind cereal, ducking behind the clothes, trying to get around them. No good logical person hides behind cereal and ducks behind clothes. No, bitterness is controlling your life. Something is controlling, but when you let the Holy Spirit come in, he begins to look at bitterness and anger, and he says, it's time for you to bow down. There's a new sheriff in town. You've been plaguing her for too long. You've been destroying his mind for too long. It's time for some freedom in here, and I'm going to give it to her. That's what happens. That's what happens to us when he comes in and begins to control our lives. We try our best to do it. We try to, our best to live this Christian life the best way we know how. But I want to show you this, too. I got two more things I want to show you, and then I'll stop. But that, if I told you to come stand up here right now, and I said, I'm going to blindfold you, and I want you to walk around this church. I want you to go through every pew, go all the way, and then come all the way back up and come to me. And everybody in here is going to be talking and moving and doing their own things, doing what they want to do. And you've got to listen for my voice. I'll be speaking. I'll be doing the best I can to get to you. But I want you to get back to me. Well, you'll probably trip down these stairs. And then you'll probably trip over the pew and over some people. And you'll try to hear me, but you'll hear everybody else in here. You'll hear what everybody else is saying. You'll be swayed to and fro. And you might make it back to me. But you, when you come back, you'll be all beat up and you'll be have quit four times and sat down in the pew and said, I want to give up. I, don't, I can't do this anymore. But how about if I change the rules a little bit? If I said, okay, now we'll start back up here. And this time I'm going to take your hand and I'm going to walk with you. And I'm going to speak to you and I'm going to guide you through every pew and through every person and I'll guide you back up here where we stop. Now, which one's better? Which one's going to work out? The second one, it's going to work out great. That's what God told us when he said, you need the Holy Spirit. Because we try to live this Christian life, and we walk through, and we end up so beat up, and we try to quit, and we just say, I can't do this. God doesn't even see me. He doesn't even hear me. And he says, I'm right here. Just take my hand. I'm the one guiding you if you'll let me. I'm the one speaking to you. This is how I intended for the Christian life to be, is to be led by the Spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. That's what the Bible teaches us. I've got one more story, and then I'm going to close. I want to tell you about the story of Mark Rutland. I don't know if you know him, but he's a pastor, very successful pastor. But when he was 28 years old, he said he was the leader. He was the leader of his denomination. He was in line to be their next bishop. He was amazing. If somebody wants to help me close, I'm about to end. But he, he said that everything looked great on the outside, but on the inside. He was getting drunk every night. He was so depressed. He said he just wanted to die. He would ask the Lord to just let him die. In fact, he tried to commit suicide three times. This pastor. Everybody thought he was doing great, but he was ready to kill himself at any drop of the hat. He said he went to, he tried to drive off a bridge one day, and he went to drive right off that bridge, and he found himself on the side of the road. He had blacked out. And he was not off the side of the bridge, but his seatbelt was on him, and he was fine. He said, the next time I thought, I, w I don't want to live this life anymore. And he said, so he found his, a gun, and it was a revolver. He said, it's a, one that never misfires. He said, he loaded that gun, and he put it in his mouth till he gagged on the barrel. And he went to pull the trigger, and he said, and the gun jammed. He said, so I cleaned the gun and did it again. I didn't want to live this life anymore. And the gun jammed again. He said he truly believes that God put his finger in that barrel. And so this depressed man, he was a Methodist man, and he said he didn't believe in the Holy Ghost. He didn't believe anything about that, but he went to a conference one day for Methodist preachers. And he was outside, I mean, he was in a hotel, and he said as he walked into the hotel, he saw Methodist preachers laying on the floor crying out to God in the hallway, praying for one another. He said, we didn't pray for one another in church like this, much less in the hallway of a hotel. What was going on? What was happening? He walked into that church. 
he, he walked into that hotel where they were having church, and his best friend looked at him and he said, Mark, I've been healed and filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, Mark got mad. He said, what do you mean you've been healed and filled with the Holy Ghost? We don't believe in the Holy Ghost. He said, I've been healed. He said, I don't have the, the bones in my ear to hear with. And he said, today, he said, speak to me. And he let him speak to him. And he knew he didn't have those bones in his ear to hear with, but he could hear him. And he said, what do you mean you've been filled with the Holy Ghost? He said, Mark, I've hated my father. But if he walked through that door, I could wrap my arms around him. He said, there's a change in me. Well, Mark was mad. He said, we don't believe in this stuff. He said, I, I can't stand this. So he went and sat in the back of that church. He said, if one more person says something about the Holy Spirit, I'm going to lose it. That pastor got up to preach. He opened up his Bible. And he said, well, today I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit. And he got up there and he preached. And Mark said he didn't preach on anything I didn't believe in. He said, but after, while he was preaching, he closed his Bible. And he said, well, that's enough of that. Now let's see it. Wow, what a word. And Mark said, what in the world does he mean by that? He said, you can't end a service like that. You can't say that's enough of that. He said, where's your poem? Where's your prayer? But all of a sudden, it got hot in that room. And that pastor looked up and he said, you over there, you've got type 1 diabetes. I want you to stand up and be healed. Mark said, I knew that man. He said, I knew he wouldn't stand up. He said, I knew he wouldn't do it. He said, but that man shot to his feet and he said, I feel it. I'm being healed. And in that moment, that's the last time, that was the last day he ever shot himself up with insulin. He was healed right there. So all of a sudden, he began to speak again, and he said, over here, you've got glasses as thick as ashtrays. He said, throw them off and be healed. That man threw them off and began to scream. He said, I can see. I can see. Mark said, I didn't know what to do with myself. He said, I stood up and ran out of the hotel and ran back in three times. He said, I didn't know. He said, I walked in there, and when I did, he said, I fell to my knees, and I saw every bit of the horrible things I had done in my life flash before my eyes. He said, and I just lifted up my hands and said, God, don't kill me. So that pastor came down from the platform, and he picked him up like a child. And he said, Brother Pastor, I love you. And he said, if you knew what I had done, you wouldn't love me. And he said, Brother Pastor, I love you. And you need the Holy Spirit. And Mark said, I went to open my mouth and say, no, I don't believe in that. He said, but I heard my own mouth say, yes, that's what I need. Give him to me. He said, and he touched my forehead. And I'm the first person I ever heard speak in tongues. He said, when I left that place, I still had the problems in my life. He said, but there was something on the inside of me that was hopeful. He said, I had joy where I had never had joy. He said, I had peace where I had never had peace. He goes, I can't explain it, but I know you need it. What am I trying to tell you today? I don't know what you're going through. You can be having the most depressed days of your life. And they're saying you just need one more antidepressant. You just need some more medicine. I'm not against medicine, but you don't need that. You need the Holy Ghost in your life. Your marriage could be falling apart. And you say, I don't know what I'm going to do next. You don't need another meeting about it. You need the Holy Ghost in your life. I'm telling you, if I can tell you anything, you need the Holy Ghost. And not just one time. Not just one time and I'm done. We need Him again and again and again. Would you stand to your feet with me? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? If you're in here today and you say, I've never received the Holy Spirit, but I want Him. I want more. I'm not satisfied just living a good Christian life, doing the best I can. I want to walk in all that God has for me today. If you say, that's me, I want you to slip up your hand. Amen. I see those hands. I see those hands. And if you're in here and you say, I've been filled before, but I want more. God, give me more today. Fill me up again. Renew me afresh. If you raised your hand, I want you to get to this altar and begin to seek him. Begin to say, oh, Holy Spirit, fill me up. Fill my cup. God, I pray right now that you just begin to pour out on everyone.